I am Tahira Monique Brown, and this is Living True and Truly Living, where real people tell real stories about real issues. Today we are going to be talking about first responders, but not in the way that you think we will be talking about that. Uh, normally you're thinking about the 911 uh, operator, you're thinking about the fire department or the police department, but we're talking about those people who make that first move to call and those people who take care of the individuals after that call or the situation after that call. We're talking about before, during, and after, right here on Living True and Truly Living. It has been said that hell is the absence of light. Annihilator of Innocence is about moving from darkness into the light. With over 350,000 U.S. home fires being reported every year, sometimes we have to call on a first responder like our first guest, Mr. Lindsey King Jr. He has been an electrician for 23 years and we would like for him to tell us how his job as a first responder in that capacity can save lives. Lindsey, it's great to have you with us. I want me to call you by your first name, Lindsay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being with us. I want you to be relaxed and I want you to be comfortable with me because I'm learning from you and my audience is learning from you. So tell me a little bit about what you do as an electrician, but then we're also going to talk later about your being a ham operator as well and how that can be effective as well as a first responder. Yes, ma'am. So one of the biggest things that I'm finding is a lot of my customers are not inspecting or checking their smoke detectors. Mm -hmm. So the smoke detector is really the first line of defense in case of a house fire. But right. if we're not properly maintaining our smoke detectors. And what are some of the things that they need to do to make sure they're maintained? The easiest thing they need to do is go to that smoke detector and hit that little red button. Mm -hmm. And if that smoke detector sounds, and a lot of home, newer homes, all of the smoke detectors are uh, tied together or linked to each other. Mm -hmm. So if you press the button in one room, all of them will sound. So throughout if you the whole house. throughout the whole house. Mm -hmm. So if you do that and you hear a tone in every bedroom or, or wherever the smoke detectors are, that lets you know that your smoke detector will function in the case of a fire. So just in case I'm living somewhere where I can't afford a smoke detector, who can I go to to help me make sure I have one in my home? Oh, that, that's simple. You can go to Lowe's or Home Depot, or you can call an electrician. An electrician, mm -hmm. a qualified electrician can walk you through the purchase you need to make. That's amazing, because I didn't know that we can contact the electrician to make sure that we have our system in properly. Yes, ma'am. I may have to call you to come check out my house, because mine just keeps beeping on its own. So I need someone to make sure it's working properly, just in case I ever have that emergency. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, as an electrician, you also go and help people when there are major disasters like tornadoes, or fires, or other situations, floods, where all of a sudden there, there is no electricity. That's when you realize how vital it is to have that. Tell me how you are contacted to work on a situation like that. So two years ago, I uh, received my 
amateur radio license. Mm -hmm. And that is a FCC, Federal Communications uh, license, mm -hmm. that allows me to operate a handheld radio uh, anywhere in the United States of America. So what most people don't know is, in the case of a natural disaster, mm -hmm. if a tornado takes out the cell phone towers, there's our smartphones become useless. Absolutely. So that's when you rely on amateur radio operators and uh, Red Cross, for one, uses them in strategic locations mm -hmm. to get water and supplies where it needs to be. So I'm, st I'm still growing in this, and uh, this is what I've learned so far in my studies, but going forward, that is something I want to pursue. So you are saying that a lot of truckers also use these ham radios so that when they're out, they also can call out and make sure that this information is just getting out to some of the people that need to have this information. Of course, that's one thing we discussed when we talked is that truckers can work together to make sure vital information is getting out there via their hand radios. Hand yes, radios. It's, it's a similar concept, but in that case, those would be C, CB radios, but it's, mm -hmm. it's the same concept. That's awesome, but it's awesome to know that they're out there looking out for us yes, just as well as you were out there looking out for us as an electrician, but coming into homes and making sure that we are safe. Correct. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And good luck with that ham radio that you're learning to do because we're gonna depend on you in the future. Thank you. And as we've learned from this, that make sure that you have in your home the protection that you need by having your uh, monitor systems in place, making sure that you protect yourself and make sure your electrician uh, come in if necessary to make sure everything is working properly for you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And we'll be right back. Barbara Clark, you're in great husband. Satan's box and chain are not made of metal. Something is wrong here. Who is this man? And what dark, uncanny power enabled him to invade a family's life and hold them hostage in urban Atlanta for two years in plain sight? The bars can be grasped by hand. And the chains, they don't go a clank or I want to take a moment to explain what happened to me. Years ago, I was held hostage by a gentleman that worked on my job. Uh, maybe I shouldn't refer to him as a gentleman, but he was a victimizer that followed me, who stalked me for several months, and I didn't know he worked on my job. Um, one day he held me on my elevator at, at my work area and put a knife to my throat and threatened my life. I did everything I'm supposed to do. I begged for my life. Then I tried to reason with my perpetrator. Um, but later I said something like, what about my children? Well, he knew everything about me but that I had children. He let me go. Um, I went to let my boss know that someone accosted me. My boss didn't want to hear me say anything, so I left the job. And when I got home, he was already at my house with my children. So from that moment on, it became a two year of cat and mouse of us trying to keep ourselves alive uh, under the guise of this perpetrator um, putting guns on us, threatening our lives, uh, threatening my children and eventually uh, he raped my daughter. Uh, so I wanted to do this show and talk about the choice that I made. I was not trying to commit suicide, but I was hoping to get in a place where I could get some help. So I had taken an overdose and I ended up in a coma. And because of that coma, I live today with amnesia. I lost all of my memory and I had to relearn everything all over again. But because of those first responders, because of those, that ambulance attendant that said, something isn't right here, something is wrong. Because of the nurse and the doctor in the emergency room saying, something isn't right here, something is wrong. They began to look at the perpetrator and they noticed that the perpetrator was continuing to try to hurt me while I was in the coma. So I'm here now, not just about me, but about others out there that 
depend on first responders, recognizing that there is a problem bigger than just them coming there to get a patient. I was blessed to have someone realize that I was in a dire situation and that I had made this choice uh, and the idea was to save my children's lives. It may not work all the time, but it worked for me this time. So I want to make sure that you understand that this show is not just about the first responders that come in uniform, it's also the first responders that notices that something is wrong and take that first step to save a life and therefore my life was saved. It has been said that hell is the absence of light. Annihilator of Innocence is about moving from darkness into the light. Probation officers are often the first to be in contact with offenders. Uh, with me today I have uh, Ernest Kenty, and he's a probation officer, but I, was, I also want to talk about the parole process. Uh, when uh, an offender is about to be paroled, or possibly be about to be paroled, you are contacted. I'm just saying this from what I think is. You're yeah. contacted to mm -hmm. make sure that that paroled person continue to do the right thing in society and continue to merge into society as a profitable and possible, uh, positive uh, person in society. Yes, yes, kind of, kind of, sort, of. sort of. Okay, yeah, um, first this, all, is where, this is where yeah, I take time yeah, to listen. No, but, no problem, okay, thanks for having me. Thank you, um, this, thank this you for is joining a, And I'm proud of you for, for being so brave. It, oh, it's, it's awesome. Brave? It's awesome. I, you're the one that has to be brave yeah. going out there dealing with these offenders on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Well, the first thing is, you know, we're, we, as, as probation officers, we have to make sure that the community is first. Mm -hmm. um, um, part of our job is to, to, and I believe my opinion, the hardest part of our job is to get someone to change the way they think. Yes. You yeah, know, yes. and, and, and if, if we don't do that, then you see recidivism being high, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't whether you just get out of prison and then get back in prison. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times we, we, we do see that mm -hmm. and um, it, it is a huge undertaking, but we do the best we can. But isn't the situation with that has to do with the fact that a lot of them are released back into the same society that got them in prison in the first place? Absolutely. Uh, just had this conversation with a, with a colleague last week, and we were talking about the change element. Mm -hmm. You know, everything mm -hmm. is moved towards, we call it cognitive behavioral therapy. That means right. changing the mental, changing what you the think. The thought processes. But we're asking a person to change their thought processes, but they're in the same environment. Mm. That's hard. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's impossible because I've seen it done, mm -hmm. but that's a way to look at it. And so, you know, what do you do with that? A lot of times we don't have resources to get somebody, mm -hmm. you know, to move across town or somewhere or outside of their environment. You know, we're busy trying to get them the job to be able to to eat. But it'll know. be difficult to move them out of the environment they, come in, they came from because people on the other side of town is like, don't bring them over here. You know, when I've seen where they've started uh, shelters or places like that for people that's coming out of prison and they want to build them in certain neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. The neighborhoods fight because they don't want those people that's coming out of prison in their neighborhoods mm -hmm. because they're afraid of uh, the possibility of crimes happening because they're there. Absolutely. That, that's one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're talking about building shelters in a neighborhood, mm -hmm. absolutely. I know, you know, we hear all the time. Our recovery news. homes. Our recovering homes, mm -hmm. right. I, was, I wasn't necessarily talking about the shelters per mm -hmm. se, but just a, a person. They, yeah. they, they may be moving back with a brother that absolutely. lived in a certain, but we want to get them an apartment out of that area, mm -hmm. you know, not mm -hmm. necessarily moving into a shelter. So yeah. other than an apartment complex, you know, sometimes different places will run criminal background histories and, yes. it's, and it's gotten, you know, uh, even dif more difficult for people to even get an apartment.
their families. That's, that's true. So what do you do with people that continue to con, um, commit crimes mm -hmm. as a probation officer? How do you go and get that person to have to resubmit them back into prison? Right. Well, I've been doing this for 17 years, mm -hmm. so I've, I've seen some of everything, you know, and, and um, there's no quick answer to, uh -huh. to, to that, you mm -hmm. know. Each person is different. You know, each person that sits in front of my desk, I could have a drug kingpin mm -hmm. or I can have a politician, you know, I can yes. have a doctor. Mm -hmm. So it runs the gambit on, on, on the actual crime, whatever they're indicted for. One thing that's, that's even across the board, they had a judge that sentenced them to time mm -hmm. and supervision and I have to make sure they do those conditions. It doesn't matter who you are, you know, if the conditions are there. So if they are at a place where mm -hmm. they're, you know, not willing to make a change and they continue to do the things that they're doing, you know, the system is there to welcome them back with open arms. I would like to thank you for joining me today. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma and I want to say to my audience, uh, Mr. Kenty is saying that they are doing everything in their power to make sure that when someone is released from prison, that they are trying to work with that person to be able to live in society again, to be able to make great choices, to be a positive influence in the society once they're released out there. And hopefully that they don't go back into prison. Absolutely. And you have to start this all over again. What I love about what uh, Mr. Kenty did in this, this speech just a moment ago is he looked at people from all types of society. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again for having me. Thank I you. knew it was going to be great. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Barbara Clark, you're in great hospital. Satan's box and chains are not made of men. Something is wrong here. Who is this man? And what dark, uncanny power enabled him to invade a family's life and hold them hostage in urban Atlanta for two years in plain sight? The bars can be grasped by hands And the chains, they don't go a clank or two. Now, in this part of the show, um, it is very important that I express to you why first responders uh, was important to me where it concerns my husband, who is sitting with me. Um, he works for the Birmingham Business Alliance here in Birmingham, Alabama with this long title. I'm going to have to have him tell you what that is. I'm married to the man, but I don't know what he do. <laughs> <laughs> but my husband uh, experienced three incidences within the last couple of years, and one was a, a car accident where his car was practically totaled. But uh, God was with him and God said no. Uh, we had a police officer that responded to that call and uh, then later he had an episode with uh, a diabetes episode, I call it a diabetic crisis uh, with DKA and uh, he probably would not have lived the next 24 hours if we had not gotten him to the hospital in time. And then third but not least, he actually ended up having uh, open heart surgery and having to have five bypasses. So, Victor Brown, can you tell us what you do at the Birmingham Business Alliance? Yes, I sure can. So, I'm a uh, vice president of business development at the Birmingham Business Alliance, and in my role, I work with companies of all sizes to help them grow and develop, to help them uh, obtain what they need to grow, whether that's capital, whether that's uh, new business in terms of uh, revenue, uh, hiring employees that can help them accomplish their goals and objectives. So all of those things are a uh, part of what I do. We're an economic development organization mm -hmm. and a chamber of commerce uh, to stimulate growth in the seven county Birmingham region. Now you see why I couldn't say all that. But with that said, one of the things that was most important that took place when my husband was going through this is his boss never left him. His boss reassured him that his job was waiting for him. But not only that, the person that you had the car accident with, the two of you actually prayed together. 
Yes, I walked over to her car. She was sitting in her car, I was sitting in my car, and I was very, very shaken because literally, uh, as her car turned in front of mine, I, I tried to go against, uh, avoid friction of hitting her directly uh, when she turned in front of me. So I turned with her car then to the left. Then I was headed toward a concrete ravine right in front of me, and at the speed I was going, I probably would not have survived. So I was able to get my car back on the road again, and so I was shaking for a while, but I got up and walked to her car, uh, and then we got to talking, and then she started praying for me. Uh, when a police officer got there, he was a very kind gentleman, and when I told him that they had prayed together, the cop says, the thing to do right now is to keep you too calm, and he just let them handle everything, the two of them that was in accident. Wonderful cop, wasn't he? Yes, he was. A praying police officer uh, came to their rescue. Uh, the incident with the DKA. So for about a week, it was uh, the middle of March of this year, and I began to not be able to eat anything. One day I went and got some breakfast, and uh, I ate half of it, and this was a breakfast. I love bacon and eggs and mm -hmm. toast. Mm -hmm. And I noticed I could barely eat the breakfast. I was having trouble drinking. So I finished what I could and then actually brought the food home. Mm -hmm. Never have I brought home a bacon and egg breakfast before because I normally can finish it all. Yes, you do, and I can testify to that. That's <laughs> so for sure. <laughs> I, I brought it home, and then as each day went by, I noticed I was having trouble eating to the point where I wasn't eating anything. And uh, the last day before I came home and just really collapsed, I had done a uh, panel discussion, could barely walk from my car into the hotel to lead that panel discussion. I was able to do that. Then got back in my car, was supposed to actually drive to the doctor's office, but I couldn't go there. Went home, thought I was catching the flu, mm -hmm. and had gone to the doctor's office several times that week complaining of, I think I'm getting the flu and getting medicine. I was taking uh, uh, some medicine for that and then finally got home, got in the bed, didn't wake up till the next morning, got in the tub. Well, and I had actually to put you in the tub. And I couldn't get out. He couldn't get out. I had to get him out of the tub. I had to bathe him. I had to dress him. And then I called the doctor and I said, we're on our way. And, and I took him to the doctor. They saw him get out of the car. He was I heard them say, he's here from inside the building. Victor was totally emancipated. He was from 200 and some pounds to... 209 to 169. To 169. But the and doctor's office days. told, were, they were upset because I didn't make it to the appointment the day before, so they told you, well, you can't bring him, he needs to I make told another him, appointment. I'm bringing him. <laughs> and they said, well, we'll be, we'll be here when he gets here. So when we got there, and Dr. Blackburn, I'm going to say his name, uh, saw him and saw his condition, uh, ran some tests. My husband's fingers were blue. Saw that he wasn't getting oxygen. And uh, got on his knees and prayed for Victor until the ambulance got there. The ambulance saw Victor's condition and turned to me and asked me, was I OK? They took him and took off. I'm like, got to find the hospital. Uh, when I got there, a, a, nurse, a, uh, a doctor barely could reach over the bed. She was so short. She was giving him a philosophy conversation. And she was saying to Victor, I've seen the other side of the mountain. And normally I'm working with people that I know is a life I'm going to save. But you're a dying man, and I need you to help me fight. And Victor kept going in and out. And finally, she's she looked at him and she leaned over into him. She says, I'm going to tell you this. She told him the story again. I'm on the other side of the mountain. I'm trying to save your life. And I need you to help me fight for your life because you're a dying man. And Victor started crying. When he started crying, she says, he's ready to live now. Come on, everybody. And everybody just started in on him. And they wheeled him away. And they says, who can visit him? And me not thinking, I said, clergy. And that place filled up with praying men coming to pray for my husband. Before they got him in there, one guy was running through the hospital saying, I heard Victor's here. The house, this church called me and says, we had to put up another line for Victor because people are calling from everywhere, wanting, where is Victor? I've heard, you know, and I was, I was just totally in shock because I'm, I'm 
you're telling me my husband may die. And then when they let me back there, this nurse tended to him all night. This part I can tell because you was out of it. She prayed every time she would touch him. And she would say, I'm only going to give you the bad news. I'm only going to give him good news. She didn't want no loud noises around him. She didn't want anything but him to concentrate on coming from under that. She says, most people stay here two or three weeks, but we're going to get him out of here. He was there, what, four days? About or something? seven days. Seven days. Uh, but then he went to get a follow-up, and they found out something was wrong with his heart. This man, I'm thinking he's going to go next few days. He done asked for seven, 10, 14 days. So they put him in the hospital to run tests and really they come back and tell him, Mr. Brown, this is very dire. Um, we're going to have to do surgery. This is not one of those we can put a stent in or anything like that. And he's sitting there thinking about his work. The next speaking engagement he's got to do. The next person he's got to take care of for the BBA. And I put my hands on my hips and I said, I know you're kidding, right? Uh, here's a man telling him, you may not make it to the next week. We've got to do this now, once again. Uh, and he's, he, he committed, but he had no idea how bad it was, um, how bad a shape he was in. Because of his diabetes, he could not tell he was having heart attacks. He could not feel them, and they call it the widow maker. So once again, I could have been a widow in three times, and God said no. Hmm. That's so true. And, and first responders, it really... When Tahir told me she was going to do this show and we were talking about first responders, it really hit home with me that several times and even before uh, the car wreck took place, uh, there had been situations where she would notice something about me, say something, and then I would end up getting it confirmed at my physician or at my uh, heart doctor. So having that person that's close, that really that good Samaritan, being that good Samaritan in someone's life, whether it's a wife, whether it's somebody that pulls over to the side of the road, those are real first responders. So now we're going to change courses and talk about uh, when you and I got together and you started supporting me with my story. What drove you to continue this road with me and now working toward doing the movie version of my life story. Why would you stay with me after all that I had told you with a woman who had been held hostage for two years, a woman who had two children that was struggling in society, I have an special needs child whose parents had died earlier. I had given him all these stories to make him leave, <laughs> but he wouldn't leave. He kept coming. Why? So when I first met Tahir, when I first saw her, I was at a Super Bowl party and didn't have a date, was supposed to have one, but it didn't happen. So I'm sitting there <laughs> watching, and then this beautiful woman walks in, and I get all upset because, man, you know, she's coming in with somebody mm -hmm. great, you know. So anyway, I was able to position myself to sit next to her during the Super Bowl game. Played innocent. And uh, <laughs> we talked about the game, and I just... Uh, her aura and things about her just really attracted me. So uh, then when she was leaving, I was getting upset. I didn't have her number. I didn't know if I was going to ever see her again. So the guy that she was on a date with comes back. He was not a date. He was on a, He was set up for the date you were supposed to have. <laughs> okay. The lady had double booked a woman <laughs> with, with the photographer that came with me. Well, no, we weren't dating, honey boo. So, well, I think he thought he was on yeah, one, but well, she didn't agree. He also wanted to be with the other date then because I didn't think we were on a date. So uh, <laughs> she was in the film business. I was in the music industry, and he thought that was a great thing. I was like, this, okay, most of the time <laughs> I try to be a nice guy and say, well, maybe if I'm nice and be her friend, then maybe I could date her later. I, I made up my mind I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let her know immediately <laughs> I'm interested. So... Next day, I called her, uh, told her that I was really interested in her for more than just business. And in my heart, I felt like, wow, here's somebody I want to see every day for the rest of my life. And I never said that before, felt that way. Hello there, everybody. This is Tahira Monique Brown. Thank you so much for supporting me today and watching Living True and Truly Living, where real people tell real stories about real issues. Thanks for supporting me by watching my winter series 
uh, when we shot this, uh, my special needs was um, in the last throes of life. I had just gotten news that we may have to put her in hospice. And the night before, she had had seizures through the night. And uh, I left her in the care of my daughter when I came to film. Uh, I had been crying throughout the day. And my director took time to comfort me. Uh, because, you know, like they say, the show must go on. And uh, I was, de you know, I was determined to make it through. Even though I kept telling my husband I really shouldn't be doing this show today. And I thank all the teams that stuck by me. I thank Clarissa Kenty for bringing her husband at the last minute, uh, Ernest Kenty, for us to interview him. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone that participated in this project. I want to thank Lindsay for talking to us about responders dealing with, the, you know, the fires and things like that. And uh, also Victor Brown. Uh, I want to talk to him about how first responders helped him with the um, fire department coming to take him and rushing him to the hospital when they didn't think he was going to make it and what the outcome of that was. So there's actually three parts to this. So um, thank you for supporting me. Please subscribe to my channel. Give a thumbs up. Uh, encourage me. Inspire me. Uh, and I would like to encourage and inspire others that are doing artistic things across the universe. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, if you got any comments, please leave comments uh, below and I will answer them. Uh, I will try my best to answer them all. Uh, this is to hear Monique Brown. Thank you for your support over the years. Uh, so, you know, part two and part three will be coming up pretty soon. Have a fantastic day. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.